I'm going to talk about the Qt Automotive Suite and what's happened over the last year. Uh, just some quick words about myself. Uh, my name is Johan Tallin. Uh, I work at a company called Luxoft. Uh, we were Pelagicor last year, uh, and now we're Luxoft, same crew. Uh, I have some background in, in writing various things about Qt. I've done parts of the development, a very small part of the development of uh, Qt IBI back in the day. Uh, but now I'm more into solutions and, and architecture and those parts of it. So PowerPoint engineer, if you ask my colleagues. Um, <coughs> So yeah, I, I just wanted to start very quickly. What, what is Qt Automotive Suite? What, what do we provide? So I mean, we, we have a number of non-graphical core components. The, the application manager that, that lets you start, stop, update, install, and so on, applications. So it basically makes, turns Qt from an application development toolkit to an actual ecosystem toolkit, so to speak. You can build your system UI. We have Qt IVI, as the previous speaker spoke about, uh, the Qt abstraction layer to, towards the underlying platform. Uh, and we have a module called Qt Geneva Extras, which lets you integrate towards the Geneva system, which has certain standardized open source automotive subsystems. Uh, we have some tools. We have QML Live, which we'll look at later. Uh, you also get Gamma Ray, uh, fully integrated into Qt IVI and so on, so you get good introspectability to the whole stack. Um, and we have integrations of the application manager and Qt Creator to, to do this click play and you have it on your target, fully running, fully compiled. We also provide Neptune, which is a reference UI. Um, it's a center stack, it has an instrument cluster, it has a white label prototype app store, let's call it that. But it, it has a way to distribute applications to, to the app store. Or, or to the uh, to the head unit, uh, you can see it in our booth running live. Um, so, so it sort of gives you all the building blocks, puts them together, and shows you how it's supposed to be done. And that's really what we want to to provide. We we have we we have a reference solution to the problem, but all cars look different. Uh, we we also solve some of the key issues that we run into, and and this is a direction where we're growing. So we add more and more solutions as we go along. Uh, so news from uh, from the last year is actually notifications, prioritizations. We, we've generalized some of the building blocks that you need to be able to do that. Uh, but application lifecycle is one of the key aspects of the application manager that we add, and also security, a chain of trust from your application bundle all the way into runtime, so that you know where the Wayland surface comes from. And this is a trusted process that belongs to a certain manifest, that belongs to a certain bundle that came from someone that you trust. So, so what you need to do when, when getting the, the suit is, is to provide the, the OEMification, so to speak. You, you need to integrate it into your vehicle. All vehicles are different. All car makers are different. All, or, all car models are different in some way. Uh, you always want something that differentiates, so you need to add your specific features, the cool things that makes people pick up just your car. Uh, and then when it comes to application stores, do you even want to present it at a, as an app store, or is that just a way for you to push <laughs> updates? If you want an app store, do you want to monetize on it? Those parts you need to, to handle, the, the back office part, basically. But what we want to do is we want to put developers first in this business in, in automotive. So, so we want it to be very easy to get started to develop. We want it to be easy to develop. Uh, we want to provide what, what made cute for me, the great documentation. You, you're supposed to have good how-tos, so it's easy to get started. And then all the tools, pre-integrated and just one installation and you're good to go. Develop for emulator, deliver, develop for target, develop for targets, depending on the setup. So that's a very quick background to, to what we're trying to achieve and, and what we're trying to provide and what we're not trying to provide. Um, but then I had the fun exercise of just dumping all the change logs from the past 12 months and <laughs> trying to summarize that. And I can tell you there are lots and lots of little code changes and those aren't that interesting. I mean, it's great. The code is alive. We have contributors from, from a lot of companies, uh, all three parties of the automotive suit, KDAB, us from Luxoft and the Qt company are actively working in the code base. We see other companies as well. Um, but I want to highlight some of the, uh, the key changes in my view. 
So let's do that component by component. So the first one I want to look at is the application manager. And for those of you who don't know it, it's a Wayland compositor. Uh, so you do graphics compositing, you do input management, all of that. But it also owns the application, so to speak. So it does the installations, the updates, the removal, sort of that life cycle, but also start, stop, pausing, managing the life cycle of, of the applications. And in a multi-screen setup, it could also be the component that puts graphics on the correct screen and so on. And finally, it also provides the runtime for what we call the system UI. So you do your compositor in QML, um, and there you can actually add some logic into that QML. So the early UI is running inside the application manager. And we, we, we're solving automotive problems. And one of the biggest challenge that we always see is the timing and the fidelity. You need 60 FPS, and you need to be up and running very quickly. So we have a number of support components for that. So, so you have the startup timer, which is a very simple component in itself, but it allows you to measure startup timing. Uh, you can add custom checkpoints, so you can sort of measure where you are in the sequence at what point in time, so you can understand what's happening. Do, do I need to postpone loading part of the UI? Do I need to, to do things in a different order? Uh, and you can use this both for individual applications, but also for the system UI, where it's, where it's most commonly used. Uh, usually I have requirements that the, the rear view camera should be up within two seconds, the, the UI should be visible within four seconds, you should be able to interact with it within five seconds, things like that. And this allows you to measure that and actually have a KPI and, and follow up on it. Um, and let me see if I can bring up a pointer here. So this is actually an output from that component, from the start timer, showing you graphically where you are, the different time stamps, and basically the names of your checkpoints. And this is from the Neptune UI, from, from the demo we have, and it's a bit slow up. Um, we have a process monitor that allows you then to centrally monitor frame rates for Wayland surfaces, memory usage, CPU load, and so on, to, to monitor your system and the behavior of the different components in your UI. Uh, and also a system monitor that lets you do this on a more central level. What's the frame rate towards the frame buffer? Uh, how do you use your memory? What's the total CPU load? How many CPUs do you have? Um, and this is a very small example of, of how that can look. And you can basically do these plots and, and sort of try to understand and monitor how the system behaves. Notification manager. Uh, we, we had an org free desktop notifications interface all along but we actually generalized how you can prioritize so you can add an importance to your notifications. You can say if it's sticky. Is this something that just pops up and then it's gone, or is it something that should go into a notification list? Uh, you can associate actions to notifications. You can show progress, which is something that's interesting to basically have a progress bar in the notification. And you can also provide timeouts so that you take an action by default if nothing happens within a specific certain of time. That could be actually doing something or just closing it. Um, so this is some screenshots from the, from the Neptune UI. So here we have one important notification, one less important notification, and then we have the notification center down here actually showing the aggregated sticky notifications that we have in the system. We've done some work on, on the code base. There, there's constant refactorings and, and small changes in there, but one of the big things is that we've started using C++11 um, and actually pushing for that. So there shouldn't be any, any old null pointers in the code base. We, we start decorating with no except, for instance, to, to show that we don't throw exceptions and, and so on. Improving and modernizing the code base. And then I got sent this one. I'm, I'm not sure if you can pick out what the, uh, what the funny thing is about it. So, so this is the application manager running in a multi-process mode, so basically a Wayland compositor, but it's running under OS X. So, so we have Wayland running on OS X, which is really nice because then you can do like multi-process uh, development there and actually de debug your application as its own process and, and get the correct Linux behavior even on MacBooks. So, continuing to, to the next component, Neptune, which, which is closely connected to Application Manager uh, from a demonstrator standpoint. So, Application Manager is not a graphical component. Uh, Neptune is what shows what Application Manager can do. 
Uh, it's our reference UI. We, we have a number of applications in there, settings, navigation, media, browsers. I'm sure there's a few more. Uh, there are some downloadable apps. There are some pre-installed apps and so on. To just showcase the different life cycles you can have for applications and how to deploy them and so on. Uh, the most visible change is actually quite small, but I, I still want to spend some time on it because it, it sort of demonstrates the power of merging the knowledge of applications with the knowledge of graphical surfaces. So, so we have this window overview page, so you can see all the applications running. The cool thing is that they're running live, so go out and try it in the demo. The map moves, the movie moves at the same time, so it's, it's really nice from, from that perspective. And you have these X's, so you can actually close the applications forcefully. Uh, but just looking a bit at the code, how this works, so we, we have a grid view. Is it okay if I just stand here and point? People follow the code still? Um, we have a grid view where we take each of these surfaces, we pull them through a shader effect to actually get them to show there. Um, and then we have connections to the application manager interface. So every time we get a new surface, we add it to the grid view model. I, I stripped out some boilerplate code. All of this is on code.util.io under Neptune, so, so you can look at the full details. But every time we get a new surface, we put it in there. Every time we lose a surface, we remove it from the model. And that, then it just works. So, so this is what you would do with sort of a valent compositor. What application manager adds is that if you click on the application, the top one, on clicked, so we say application manager start application, which is short term for bring it up on top. So if it's already running, which is obviously because you clicked its screen, it will still be brought into foreground. Uh, and this can affect C group rules and so on. So, so you can deprioritize the rest of the application, things like that. And then we do a little for loop to, to just push the other surfaces down. Uh, and if you click on, on the X, the tool part there, we basically say stop the application and, and we pull the actual application from the model item, the surface in there. So we have an association from the composited surface to the application instance. We know which application is running what. And this we can then track back to the actual installed bundle and we can cryptographically ensure that we trust it and so on. But there's actually a lot of power and convenience in associating these two parts and bringing them together in a single component. But the big thing that's happening, I mean, adding that page, that's not a lot of development for a year. Uh, the big thing that's happening is that we're redesigning Neptune. So, so it's been an old demo, it's been living for a number of years, we've adapted it, we've extended it, and you know what happens with code in that case. So, so there's gonna be a facelift. I, I hoaxed a screenshot from one, one of our design, designers. He said it's not final, don't show it, but yeah, there are concepts, they're working on it. Uh, so we're going to do a graphical update, uh, different screen formats. Uh, we're going to have a, a new layout strategy based on this. Uh, we're also going to introduce Qt Quick Controls too. Right now we use QML controls, which are inherently slower. So this is going to improve, improve the performance. Continuing on, uh, Qt IVI, the abstraction layer. Uh, the previous speaker talked about it, but basically it's the abstraction between QT space and the rest of the platform. It's the bindings that you need there. And since Automotive usually has a lot of custom APIs facing the applications, we, we have provided a pattern and sort of a structure for how you do that. Uh, it's completely agnostic to what IPC you're using. You can use it on any platform because we really don't care how you feed the data into Qt, but there's a clear structure of where you have your platform-dependent code and where you have your Qt code. Uh, we load the backends dynamically, which means that you don't have to discover a backend and sort of instantiate an object programmatically up in your QML and then create the bindings. You can create the facade object and bind to it as if it's there, and then you have a property available that goes through when the backend is loaded, which means that the QML is really nice. You can also interchange backends, either at deployment time or at runtime, and this allows for, for service discovery. You can say who provides this interface, you get a list of interfaces, for instance, media sources, and then you can pick a different backend for the same UI, depending on which media source is currently active. And you can inject uh, stubs or simulators and so on there as well. So it's, it's a really powerful pattern. 
Right now we have a mature reference implementation of, of a media stack, so indexing, playback, all of that, uh, and vehicle functions. I think it's Windows and climate control that we have there, but, but more vehicle-related functions. Uh, but the big thing that's happening is that we're integrating a piece of technology called QFACE, which is a code generator that's aware of Qt. So Qt has a number of patterns. The, the biggest one is really the, uh, the item models that you need to be able to express in your IDL, or, or you need to sort of recognize that higher abstraction in the IDL somehow. So, so we have an IDL where you can express a model, where you can express, well, cute behaviors, basically. Uh, and the nice thing about it is that it's built on Jinja, if you know that. It's the Python templating framework used for, for web applications. So it's super easy to extend. It's, I mean, if you can do PHP or something like that, it's, it's even easier, I'd say. Uh, and it's fully integrated into your QMake, CMake build workflow. It, it just fits in. And, and we're not abandoning the handwritten APIs. What, what we're recognizing is that in automotive, you usually have a lot of generated APIs that change either between OEMs or even between car models. The typical one is, is the vehicle network. You might have hundreds of signals coming from the vehicle network that are slightly different between cars. So handwriting that doesn't really fly. It doesn't scale. So, so we see that we have handwritten APIs for, for the things that are static, where we can sort of agree on this is a good application-facing API for it, for media tuning or Bluetooth and so on. But we also have a generation, a code generation strategy for the rest of the APIs. So basically what you do is you have an IDL, an interface description language, that one gets pulled into QFACE and we create an in-memory model of that IDL. So basically a syntax tree that you can traverse. You have a number of generators, which is just Python code that traverse the, uh, the model and produces source files. And then we have a default set of generators that produces what you need to use Qt IBI. Uh, but the nice thing is that the, uh, the IDL is, is Qt-centric. So you sort of recognize yourself, you have signals, you, you have enums, you have interfaces, you have structs, you have models, and so on. You, you can express all those parts that you see as a part of the Qt, Q object interface. This thing gets turned into, uh, into a model that looks like this. Uh, I won't go into detailing, but what, what you do in the ideal then is that you simply traverse it. So we say for every module in system module, we're climbing the tree, for interfaces in module interface, so for all the interfaces, and then we can print out service and the model interface, and then all the structures, and we basically get the struct and the name of the structure. So it's, you can really write C++ code, and then you just have these double curly braces in there to, to, to do basically symbol or, or injection of strings in, into your template. So you can read the template as C++ code. And it's super easy to create a new template or to tune the template slightly and so on. So, so if you have the top half of Qt IVI and you want to bind it to your own IPC southbound, then you simply write your own generator for that. And, and you, can, you can basically read it up and down. It's not a set of code that generates a string that gets written to a file. It's the template. QML Live. Um, it's a library loader, but it also has sort of a client architecture. So, so what you can do is that you, you save your QML files and they automatically reload. So it's, it's a quicker way. You don't have to restart the application all the time. Uh, I use it when I have two screens because I don't have a window popping up on the one screen the whole time. I can just keep it on the secondary screen. Uh, but it's also server client. So, so you can run the viewer part on your target. So you simply connect to the target, which you discover through the network, it's super easy. And then you save your QML files locally, and they just go over to the target. So it's really designer friendly. And it turns down the, the turnaround time to, to milliseconds. Uh, I want to highlight that we've seen many contributions from Yola here. So it's, that's really nice, and thank you. Uh, but it's being actively used with outside the automotive space, which is cool. Uh, parts of what's been done is that they've extracted core parts of it into library. They've taken care of some bugs, some corner cases that we don't encounter, and they've dropped the dependencies to QWidgets. You get a leaner deployment. Really nice. 
And there's, of course, more. I mean, Qt Automotive Suite consists of more components. Uh, we have Qt itself, which has progressed over the last year. Gamma Ray, I know Volker will talk about later on today. Uh, we have the Qt Genevi Extras module where we continuously improve. So things are moving along. But where are we heading then? Neptune, we do a redesign, we, we do a reference implementation using Qt Quick Controls. We get closer to actually having a reference that we want you to reuse. Uh, we're going to introduce Qt 3D for vehicle visualizations. We've been using various 3D engines there depending on the hardware earlier. Uh, and we're integrating Squish into it. So we actually showcase how to, how to test a big HMI code base. Uh, we're adding a new instrument cluster. Uh, as you know, we have the, the safe renderers so that we can be functionally safe, ISO 26262, uh, and so on. For, for Qt IVI, there are a number of handwritten APIs under code review, uh, but we're also refactoring the vehicle settings to use QFACE because we believe that's the correct way to approach vehicle settings. Uh, emulator gets enhanced. It supports multiple screens and things like that. And we are actively working on more how-to documentation. We have good reference documentation of everything, but we want to give the big picture. How do you actually get in there? How, how do you start? And I just want to round up with where do you get this then? So, so of course, you, you have the Q.io site where you have an automotive section. But there's also an automotive or cute automotive spin of the Geneva development platform. So you can grab it from there. And there's plogs.io, which is going to be uh, a pre-integrated setup. Right now, I don't think we have hardware images, but a lot of the documentation is being aggregated there where we pull in both the Yocto Linux side of things and the cute automotive suit to, to show you the full picture. And with that, I think we have a few seconds left for questions. <laughs> I see a hand. Actually, uh, so two questions. Yep. So, uh, maybe we guess it in the online uh, order. The question is when you reload, does it restart the app like, all the way back to the start, or it stays the same? I believe it restarts the application, so you need to sort of maintain the state yourself. It detects a change in the QML's uh, files and then updates the files and restarts the application. Okay. And then, uh, for Netflix, what is the license? What's the license for Neptune? Is it GPLv3? I think so. Alex is nodding. But it's on, on code.qt.io, so feel free to, to check it. I think the libraries are LGPLv3 and the tools are RGPLv3. Uh, and since this is sort of in between, I'm not actually sure what, what license it is. Yep. But it's aligned with what Qt, the Qt code base has. Any more questions? Then I'd like to say thank you. Thank you for your time.